the Valium at Adrian's Wall. Currently, archaeologists believe that the Valium is a massive earthwork constructed shortly after Adrian's Wall itself and lying just south of it. Many visitors confused the Valium with Adrian's Wall itself because it's such an obvious and impressive feature within the landscape. In fact, the Valium is made up of several elements. A ditch around 6 metres wide and 3 metres deep. Two mounds either side of the ditch, about 6 metres wide and 2 metres high, and set back from the ditch about 9 metres. And often a third mound on the south edge of the ditch. The whole complex is around 36 metres across. Usually the Valium runs very close to the wall, but in rocky hilly sections of the Valium, it lies about 700 metres from the wall. Crossing points seem to be located south of each of the forts along Adrian's Wall and near several of the mile castles. Evidence from the excavated Valium across Benwell in Newcastle shows that the crossing points had impressive monumental gateways. Many archaeologists think that it marks the southern boundary of a military zone, with the wall itself forming the northern boundary. This would have helped protect the rear of the wall and the associated military installations with civilian access being closely controlled. The gateway at Benwell supports this idea. The numerous gateways along the wall and forts suggest that the frontier was indeed as much to control movement as it was a defensive line. Traders would have moved goods across the frontier, but their movements would have been controlled and their goods taxed. Relatively soon after its construction, some 20 to 30 years, the Valium seems to have lost its function. The mounds were cut through and the ditch filled in at fairly regular intervals. It was out of use by the time the forts along the wall were recommissioned at the late 2nd century AD following the return of the garrison from the Antaline War. What you see in front of you is a LiDAR map of the Valium at Adrian's Wall. As we fly over it, observe Adrian's wall is marked by a line to the left and in front is the Valium as we see it today. This is the first published LiDAR flyover map of Adrian's wall ever produced. The interesting aspect is that it clearly shows that the Valium is not a defensive feature as described by archaeologists. This can be easily proven by the fact it has gaps within the structure and almost 30% of it missing. This evidence is the basis of our second book of the quadrilogy about linear monuments called the Vallum, which shows that really this was originally an ancient prehistoric dike that was reused by the Romans. The series show that all 1,500 linear monuments within Britain were in fact prehistoric canals, which were constructed around the ancient shorelines of the past. We can now reveal that the Vallum is 73,916 metres or 4.93 miles in length, somewhat shorter than the wall. The total of missing Vallum is 42,339 metres, which is 26.31 miles or 36% of the Vallum. This is because there's a total number of gaps in the vellum, numbering 49, which means there's 
because the start and the end. 51 gaps all in all within the Vallum. The book splits the 46 miles of the Vallum into 22 portions named A to V. What we will do now is go through and fly over the Vallum and stop at interesting aspects, mostly the gaps and strange anomalies within the Vallum to explain why this was prehistoric and how we can see from the evidence from the LiDAR map that it was actually built before the Romans and the Romans recut and utilized it in the past. So to start off, let's go back to section A to see how we can unravel this mystery. Section A, 3,234 meters long with 492 meters, 15% missing. Within our investigation, we ask, did the vallum just end or did it turn west as indicated by the LIDAR map? For as we've seen from other dikes, the start and end tell us more than any other section of linear earthwork. If we look at the crop marks from a satellite shot from 1985 of the termination point of the vallum, we see it west and continues in the ground connecting to a line of fuel boundaries which leads to a paleo channel. This turn would not offer any military advantage, but the size and direction of this channel would suggest that it was a prehistoric linear feature that became the start of the vallum at Adrian's wall. Analysis of the wall aligned compared to the vallum is strange and can only be explained by the variation in the river level during the Roman period. If we raise the water level of the river Isk, then we see the wall aligns with the higher water table of 8 metres during its construction period. Therefore, was the wall built to the edge of the Roman river shoreline? The existing line of the Hadrian's Wall to the north of this section shows there's a substantial amount of land after the current shoreline of the river. This makes no strategic sense as it would allow invaders to land and gather then to attack the wall. Building the wall on the river's shoreline would make much much more sense. Consequently the Roman shoreline shows that post-glacial flooding was still active 2000 years ago. As we continue to fly over section A, notice that the vallum ends as it enters old paleo channels, which in the past would have been full of water, which makes the need for a canal unnecessary. Section B, 5,504 meters long, 4,437 meters, 85% missing. Analysis of this section shows that the warm vallum disappeared for a 2.6 mile stretch without explanation until we add the probable river shorelines as it did in section A. Once these sections are added at 8 metres above today's Ersk River height, we find a simple explanation for the loss of both wall and vallum. The area is flooded. This gives us accurate data on the height of the Ersk River during the Roman period and the probable height of the Ersk during earlier periods such as the Bronze, Neolithic and Mesolithic Ages. It should be noted that the Vallum will be directly connected to the River Ersk by this encroachment onto the mainland, indicating that the Vallum would have been used as a canal which may have been constructed to transport the stone for the wall as there is a complete absence of any Roman roads in this section. There is also a possibility that the Vallum was built before the wall and that it was reused by the Romans as the section also shows vastly different construction specifications in a very short period, indicating multiple recuts of the Vallum as the water levels fell. Section C, 4,782 metres long, 
718 meters, 50% missing. Analysis of the previous section shows that the woman vallum disappeared for a 2.6 mile stretch without explanation until we came across the hill at the start of section C, which emerges from the river valley. This reappearance of the Roman features could only be explained if the river Esk was not part of the construction plan, as they could have easily built somewhere more south of the current position without the raised 8 metre river interfering with them. Moreover, this suspected raised shoreline also explains why the wall has not been built straight within section C, and it seems to bend in two places with the contours of the landscape, for the valleys to the north of the wall were waterlocked or extremely marshy and consequently could not support a heavy wall. Again, as shown in sections A and B, the vallum looks pretty independent of the wall and only mimics its alignment in a few places. This would indicate that it predates the wall as it may have been used to bring the stone to the wall as there is no evidence of any Roman roads being present within this section. The flyover shows that the predicted path of the wall is probably incorrect as shown on both the scheduled monument and OS maps as there are more obvious locations for the defensive ditch close by. This can only be verified by future excavations, which have been sparse and infrequent in the past. Therefore, any hope of locating the correct alignment of the wall in the future is unlikely. One of these suspected ditches at the end of section C is known as Mill Dykes Lane, which is clearly from the name and depth of the ditch was once a prehistoric dike which would have made a natural ditch for the wall. The vallum is also equally poorly defined on OS maps and Schiedel Monuments Register, but can be easily seen on LiDAR maps. Moreover, the railway line confuses this process as it was a reused canal ditch, which may have been part of the original prehistoric dike. The excavations in this area suggest that the wall was made of turf before the stone was introduced. So are we seeing areas of extra defences in problem areas, with the turf and probably wooden palisade wall being replaced over time with a stronger stone supplied by the vallum. Further down from Mills Dyke Lane is a town of Dykes Field. Are these tantalising logistical clues that suggests that prehistoric dikes existed much before the Roman wall and supporting canal was introduced. Section D, 3,588 meters in length, 2,112 meters, 40% missing. Analysis of this section shows that the wall follows the shoreline of the enlarged river Eden up to 8 metres above today's current level as we are already seen in sections A, B and C. This is supported by the lack of any details in English Heritage Schedule Monument description on the section. To the east, the raised waters of the pass reveals no evidence of any wall, vallum or the expected mile 66 fault. This lack of evidence is contrary to what is reported by RS maps and therefore its inclusion is pure speculation. We feel that this post-glacial flooding evidence now allows us to date the wall's construction in relation to the vallum, as shown by the missing sections as they enter and travel through river valleys, which can only be the consequence of even higher river levels than at the time of the wall's construction. The vellum in this section seems to disappear long before the current River Eden. As we have already shown, the River Eden was more significant in the past during the Roman period by about 8 metres than today. And as a consequence, the wall follows the path of the Hyatton River at 15 metres. But this is not the case for the vellum, because the distance between the two structures and different water levels causing the gaps in the construction. The Lardar map shows that the vallum not only terminating at a considerable distance from the edge of the River Eden, but also not reappearing on the opposite shoreline. 
Moreover, the missing segments of the vellum would only make sense if the river was a metre or two higher than the 15 metres we believe it was during the Roman period. This suggests that the vellum was recut before the wall was constructed. Again, this indicates that the vellum was a canal that required frequent topping up by rivers and streams feeding directly into the ditch. This is in the part one of four sections on the vellum. Click on part two now to continue the journey. Thank you.